This is our first lecture for AP Biology, and I'm having you watch this video at home so that we can move along a little more quickly, particularly because it's a really easy chapter, and also it should be, for the most part, a review of what you've already learned. So this chapter is about the characteristics of living things. In other words, since biology literally is the study of life, we're going to start with a basic definition of what life is. And so there's characteristics that all living things share, and depending on the book you look at, they're going to have seven characteristics, five characteristics. Uh, it really just depends how they separate them. They're the same characteristics, but some of them get lumped together or separated into two. So we're going to go through them the way your book does. And so the first characteristic living things um, share is that they're organized. In other words, they're put together in a particular way. And we actually know these levels of organization, which I'm sure you've learned. In other words, we start at the chemical level with atoms, and the atoms make um, compounds. And then if those compounds are assembled in a particular way, we get organelles. And an organelle is a cell part that carries on a particular function. If we assemble several organelles in a particular way, we get a cell. And it goes on from there, tissue, organ, I have the definitions of these as we go on. So we call these properties of living things, we call them emergent properties. In other words, a property that results from a particular arrangement. In other words, if you um, have wheels and uh, a chain and whatnot, you don't actually have a bicycle. You can't call it a bicycle until it's assembled. And the same thing is true here. If you're talking about a living multicellular organism, it's not actually a dog until you assemble it with a circulatory system and a you know, respiratory system, and those systems then consist of organs, you know, the circulatory system, so you're going to have the arteries and the veins and the heart and all of that. And so these properties don't emerge until you get to a particular level and there's an organization in a particular way. So another way that they're organized, and this is another characteristic that living things have, is that all living things are made out of cells. Now some living things consist of just a single cell, and so that's why we say that the smallest unit of life that can perform acquired activities is the cell, because there are some organisms that just consist of one cell. Okay, and then cells can be subdivided into two different types, prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic literally translates um, sort of the first cells or before the nucleus. Karyote actually translates, I think, into kernel, like a kernel of corn. But prokaryotic cells, very simple, they don't have a nucleus. There's other properties, but that's the main one most people remember. They're smaller, you can see over here the prokaryotic cell. It's our bacteria. And then eukaryotic cells, which are the ones that have a nucleus. The prefix EU, eukaryotic, is a true nucleus. And so the, this would be an example of a eukaryotic cell, much bigger than one with all the organelles that we're more familiar with. This, uh, this diagram is just showing the levels of uh, organization in another uh, way. So here's your molecules, and then several molecules organized in a specific way. We have the emergent property of an organelle. And then cells, tissues, uh, organ systems, the whole, the whole thing. I have the definitions here. Um, so a tissue is a group of cells that work together. For example, muscle tissue um, consists of cells that have certain properties uh, such as the property to contract. Um, organs are groups of tissues, so for example if we look at the heart, the heart is an organ but it's, it's composed of um, tissues that include epithelial, it's got a lining in it, it's got muscular tissue, particular cardiac muscle cells, um, etc. And then organ systems, you have the heart, it can't survive on its own, um, the whole system, the circulatory system is the heart, but it also includes the arteries and the veins and the capillaries and all of that. And then an organism, that's an emergent property that we see, a multicellular organism, I should specify, doesn't emerge until we see all the organ systems functioning together. Or, um, or multicellular organisms, what we see is that the individual cells of a multicellular organism can't live on their own. Um, they rely on other cells around them, whereas a single-celled organism has all the organelles. What we see in multicellular organisms is that they don't. Um, so you have cells, for example, in plants, you have um, phloem, and phloem cells carry food down the plant. But phloem cells don't have mitochondria, they don't have a way of uh, basically producing energy, so there's companion cells that work with them making this whole tissue and organ system, and those cells provide 
the the um, the energy. So what we see again in a multicellular organism is that there's a a division of labor and they're in, they're not independent anymore. A population is a group of organisms of the same species. So you can have like a population of deer, a population of ducks. They tend to be though they need to be kind of interbreeding in a particular area. And then a community is several populations. So a pond community would be the fish, the algae, um, you know, plankton, if we're talking about the ocean, um, you know, the, all the little invertebrates in the bacteria, etc. An ecosystem is, is basically these communities and then add to them the non-living things. So the minerals in the water, um, the amount of water available, the acidity of the soil, all that non-living stuff around them that's going to affect them. And then the biosphere just it means all the inhabitable areas of the whole earth. So these are our levels of organization. All right, another way we can look at uh, levels of organization is taxonomy. Taxonomy um, is those levels you learned, kingdom, phylum, class, etc. The biggest one is domain. Everything belongs to a particular domain. Originally, kingdom was the highest level, but as we've discovered more and more differences between organisms, we needed a level above kingdom. And so domain is our, is our separating level now. We have eubacteria, the true bacteria, domain archaea, which is our archaebacteria, and then eukarya, which is our eukaryotes. And there's some discussion about which one's more related to us. Um, you know, originally you think RK bacteria, oh, that would mean, you know, the ancient ones, the first bacteria. They live in uh, weird places where there's no oxygen, stuff like that. Uh, but what, we dis what we've discovered, and again, there is some controversy. If you go on Google, you'll find some that say yes, some that say no, is that sometimes what we see is that RK bacteria have a lot more in common as far as their organization their, um, their, the proteins they make, et cetera, with eukaryotic cells, the cells that compose uh, us and plants and all of that, than the eubacteria do. All right, and so here's your, here's your levels of classification. I have three organisms here, leopard, leopard, human, and parrot, just to show you. So we all belong to the domain eukarya, so we have that in common. Next comes kingdom. Well, we're all, all three of those are in the animal kingdom. If we had a plant over here, the plant would be in eukarya, but now it wouldn't have anything else in common. After that level, it wouldn't match up, So, because a plant would be in the kingdom plant. Um, then we have phylum. Since all three of these have backbones, um, then they belong to the phylum chordata. So they have that in common. I spelled that wrong, I see. Um, class, now you see where a leopard and a human are more closely related than either of us are to the birds because the birds are in a different class. They're in aves or aves, and aves have certain characteristics, beaks, feathers, etc. Mammals have different characteristics, giving milk to their young, um, live birth for most of them, and all of that stuff. Carnivora and primate. So now we see that the human and the leopard separate. Now if, let's just say, ape was in here, apes would be more closely related to humans than the leopards because we'd get down here and they would still be uh, in the same order as, as we are. And then uh, we have the family, genus, and then the species. And so this is our um, sort of a breakdown. Uh, you don't have to know the specifics of these three. You do need to know these levels. Sometimes I've heard uh, like kings play chess on fine gold sheets. Um, and, uh, and then uh, somebody in my class came up with, dang, Kevin, please come over for good, let's just say spaghetti. Um, so Kevin, please come over for good spaghetti. Uh, or darn, Kevin, and it's an easy way to remember it. Okay, um, scientific names. So binomial nomenclature. Nomenclature means a naming system. Binomial means two. And so binomial nomenclature means we have a two-name system for naming things. The genus is first, the species is second. Um, typically, they're based on Latin. You saw those weird words on the prior page. We capitalize the genus, and either it's in italics. If you see it uh, in a book or something, you may see it probably in italics, or you have to underline it if you write it out. Also, sometimes we can see um, the genus shortened. So if you have a book and it's talking about Homo sapiens and it mentions it a bunch of times, it may say Homo sapiens the first time, and then after that, it's probably just going to be H sapiens. 
So I have a cute little thing here um, in class. I was going to have us do this. So whether these were written correctly or not. So if we look at E. coli, uh, the the initial that's fine. The problem there's actually two. Number one, it's not underlined or italics, and number two, the um, the C is capitalized and it shouldn't be. And then Lumbricus terrestris. Um, problem with that one, again, not underlined or italics, and the T is capital, so that's not right. Here's another one, Paraplatoma americana. This one, yes, we've got the capital and then the lowercase, but again, it's not underlined or italics. It needs to be one or the other. This one's fine, Rosa damascana. This one, capitalized, lowercase, underlined. Musa sapientum. Uh, missing the capitalization, uh, no sorry, capitalized fine, not underlined or italics. This one's fine, hydrochoerus, hydrocharis. Uh, we have it in italics, we have a capital, we have a lowercase. C familiaris, this um, would be fine if somewhere prior they had actually said what this stood for, this is actually canis familiaris. The fact that it's in italics is fine. And then your Cinea pestis, there's a problem with this one, and that is that it's both italics and underlined, and you choose one or the other. Um, for fun, you can match them up. Um, I'm not going to give you the answers. All right. So our six kingdoms, here they are. RK bacteria, that's our ancient ones. U bacteria, which is true bacteria. Those are our two prokaryotic uh, kingdoms. And then our eukaryotes, eukarya, that's the remainder of our kingdoms, the, the um, under eukarya. Protus, protus, there's some question about whether it's even a kingdom. They are um, thinking about kind of revising it. And um, it, so right now, it, um, it isn't even for sure that it's going to stay a kingdom. But generally, what kind of gets thrown in there are all the things that don't fit in any other kingdom. So generally, they have one cell, or maybe they're colonial, meaning they have a bunch of cells that live together, but they're not necessarily interdependent on each other. So it's a little different than a multicellular organism where cells have lost their ability to live on their own. Um, Animal-like ones are called protozoa, like your amoeba, paramecium, those pond organisms. The plant-like ones are called algae, like chlorophyta is green algae. And then the fungus-like ones are called slime molds. Um, so they kind of just get thrown in there because they don't quite fit any other kingdom. Fungi, uh, like your mushrooms, molds, mildews, what they all have in common is that they're multicellular. They have a cell wall made out of chitin, and that's pronounced chitin, not chitin. And they're heterotrophic. Not only are they heterotrophic, but they all absorb food. They all secrete enzymes that break down their food, and then they absorb it, which is a little different than animals. Um, plants are multicellular also, but they're autotrophic. They make their own food, and they have cell walls made out of cellulose. So fungi and plants both have cell walls. In fact, lots of protists do as well, and most bacteria do. So when we say, oh, you know, um, plants are the only ones with cell walls, that's, that's actually, no, that's not right. Actually, it's, it's more correct to say that animals are the only kingdom that none of them have cell walls because all the other kingdoms have at least some of their organisms with cell walls. And so animals, multicellular, no cell wall, and we ingest our food. We either filter feed, um, in some cases, um, like a parasite, maybe they, they absorb it, but for the most part, we ingest our food, we eat. Here's some pictures of different kingdoms. Um, a lot of people don't know ringworm is actually a fungus. That's ringworm here on the right under fungi. Um, it's not a worm. It's actually a fungus, and it actually uh, spreads out in a ring as it's uh, basically dissolving your skin, because remember, funguses, that's what they do. They absorb their food, dissolve what's around it. Um, the next characteristic is that living things metabolize. Metabolism is basically energy uses. Anabolism, they build up, and catabolism, they break stuff down. And here's a cute little picture of it. We have the sun, the flowers absorb the sun, the cow eats the flowers, and we eat the cow. And this is sort of a, a passing on of energy and the metabolism of each of these organisms leading to the survival of the next organism. 
And the other thing is that all living things maintain homeostasis or a balance. Um, they maintain stable internal conditions and I'll talk about that in part two.